It's my great pleasure now to introduce you for right here, we've got three speakers for this next half hour of presentation. Our session, The Mouse That Roared, Innovation in the Fall of Adversity. And our three speakers to guide you through this, Chris Giles is a senior executive with considerable experience leading and managing regional, rural and remote health services. Most recently, she has worked as the CEO of Portland District Health in Southwest Victoria. And prior to this, she has spent three years living in the Torres Strait, working as a district CEO for Queensland Health. Alongside her for this presentation this morning, Dr. Marg Gard arrived in Portland, Victoria to join her partner, now husband. Being the only female GP and the youngest by at least 10 years brought with it a sense of professional isolation. And Associate Professor Lara Fuller is Director of Rural Medical Education and the Rural Community Clinical School at Deakin University in Victoria. Would you please make them all very, very welcome. I'll hand over now. So um, thanks for having us here today. My name's Chris Giles, as I've been introduced. I want to talk about the mouse that roared, and you can see it's an old Peter Sellers movie. We came up with the title because we did feel like we weren't being listened to in rural health, that it was slipping through the cracks um, between regional, metro, peri-urban services. So, we really wanted to showcase what could happen in a rural health service, and we really had to roar to actually make this happen. So first of all, I would like to acknowledge and pay my respects to the elders past and present, to those who have passed before us, and to the members of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait community who are attending here today. We want to acknowledge the Tuberal people the custodian, the traditional custodians of the lands on which we are meeting here today. Portland is on Gundichamara country. They've just had their Butch Bim aquaculture um, and whole system showcased as a UNESCO World Heritage listing, and they have a fabulous aquaculture centre down there, and I absolutely know that if you're in the southwest Victoria, they will welcome you with open arms for a visit, so I, I encourage you to go out there and have a look. So just about Portland, I, I would like you to um, refer to the abstract if you need to know more. But Portland is a rural city. It's three and a half hours from Melbourne. It's an M modified, Monash modified level four, and the surrounding district is Mon Monash modified level five. We've got about 15,000 people in the catchment and a very diverse range of industry, agriculture. We have a deep water port but we also have significant areas of the population that have high levels of disadvantage and high burdens of chronic disease. So we have lots of challenges and we're not close to anywhere. Our biggest problem was workforce. Sorry, I need to press the button. It's a really wicked problem. It's, I've heard this problem for years and years and years, and it was no different in Portland. And we needed to look at a local solution, and we came up with this program of end-to-end -end training, undergraduate to fellow. So I just want to go through some of the points of how we actually got this started. So first of all, it takes courageous leadership uh, you need to set a bold vision and be prepared to keep the momentum happening. I always think the leader needs to have head, heart and guts or wisdom, empathy and courage because you're going to need every part of that as you na navigate a myriad of complexities to make this kind of thing happen, but you can do it. 
The first thing you need to do is gain knowledge by investigating, listening and participating. I went to a number of forums, particularly one that was hosted by Paul Worley in Canberra, where I sat and listened to how do we actually get a rural medical workforce happening. Some of the things I heard were we shouldn't have rotations, we needed to keep people close to where they're working, that kind of thing was inspirational to me. So I would encourage you to find those kinds of workshops and conferences, surround yourselves by any experts that you can and listen and learn and be well prepared for the questions that will come. You need to understand each learning point in your journey. So our journey is in three parts. We have the pre-medical registration, we have the junior medical years, which includes internship, and we have the, special, the pathway to fellowship. So it was in three parts, and they all have different requirements and different segments. So you need to arm yourself with people who can explain what that is and what the learning points are. And to do that, we cast a wide net, but we didn't look too far out of our community. We found all those people within our community. Um, we got pushed back all over the place outside of the community, um, but we actually cast the net in our community. We had GPs, we had allied health members, pharmacists, nurse practitioners, um, we even real estate agents played their part when we are looking for how to get local rentals and things like that. So your community is a big asset and if you cast your net, you will find resources that you need. <coughs> the next point is paradigms. Medical workforce is full of paradigms and they're not tested. And I would encourage you, if you hit a paradigm or you get hung up on something you don't know how to move forward on, test it. Ask why and what is going on in this paradigm. An example we had was doctors can only be, interns can only be taught by doctors. Um, but when we actually tested that paradigm, we found that it was completely wrong. Um, and we actually worked out ways to involve the whole interdisciplinary team in our intern year. Um, find the right person to implement the program. We started with a Deb Hobain, who is an experienced rural critical care nurse educator, um, and she helped us get it all happening in the first year and even did some doorstop um, teaching to our medical cohorts at the time. And the last thing I want to say is, oh sorry, the next thing is be prepared for change because you'll need to change as you go along. This is rural health and you're going to find a changing platform and different parts of your program and you will need to be adaptive. Consider your community and target your services to what the community needs. In Portland, we've got an underprivileged, significant disadvantage. Paediatrics is a real issue but paediatrics seems to be very centralised. So we've looked at paediatrics and how do we solve that, but your communities will be different. So look to your communities and what areas you're targeting as you build this workforce. Look at your key relationships and you can see the list of key relationships we have there. Um, you need a university clearly to partner with, but there's rural university schools all over the country now. We worked with Tim Baker at the Centre for Rural Emergency Medicine for the emergency part. All of our senior staff are either VMOs or salaried. We used a whole range of those people, but we used them locally. Our GP training um, organisation um, was involved. Our key stakeholders were the RG group and the Victorian RG key stakeholders group. RG is rural generalist. We use our local Aboriginal health services. Um, Margs, our clinical director of the GP super clinic, which was integral to the program, and our three health services close, Portland District Health, 
Warrnambool and Hamilton. And to some extent, we wanted to use Haywood as well, but we haven't quite got that point to that point yet. And Akram were really valuable to help inform the program. So I'm going to hand over to Lara, who's going to talk about the pre-registration training component. Thank you, Chris, and thanks for the invitation to share the work that Deacon's been doing um, in partnership with Chris and Marg in Portland. So I'd like to start by just acknowledging my colleagues who have been with me on this journey um, from Deakin. So we've had a rural strategy working group and um, Professor Gary Rogers, our dean, has been incredibly supportive since he started a couple of years ago. He's with us at the conference. And I'd also like to acknowledge my colleagues in the Indigenous Health team who um, forged the ground ahead of us, really, when they introduced the Indigenous Entry Stream um, prior to the Rural Training Stream, and Candace McKenzie, who shared her experience with us as we developed the Rural Training Stream. So Deakin School of Medicine um, was established in 2008 as a, a medical school for um, southwest Victoria in the Grampians region. And as you can see on the map, we've spread across um, quite a bit of the western part of Victoria. It's a four-year graduate entry med, uh, MD course now. And the, two f the first two years are spent in Geelong on campus and followed by, by two clinical years during which students go to one of our clinical schools. Um, the largest one is in Geelong, but we have three rural clinical schools which you can see on the map. We've got two in larger um, regional towns, so Warrnambool and Ballarat, and students spend two years there. Uh, the other one is the Rural Community Clinical School, which is located in the nine towns on, represented by the orange dots on the map, including Portland, which you can see in the southwest corner near the South Australian border there. <laughs> students in that program spend uh, their whole third year doing a longitudinal clerkship program based in primary care in the general practice and the health service. And then for their fourth year, they go to one of the other clinical schools. So I became involved in the Rural Community Clinical School in 2014, and it didn't take long to hear the stories of the rural workforce shortages um, that were throughout our region. And this led us, me to think about what we um, could be doing to, to help this situation and understanding uh, our mission as a school to, to address this. Um, particularly disturbingly was that our own graduates were not seen to be returning to the towns in which they were being trained by our partners. And as we approached 10 years of operating in the region, this, this is a big problem. So we did some further investigating and looked at where our graduates were. So in 2019, we looked at um, the results for all our graduates from the first eight cohorts. And particularly interested in what was happening to those students we were admitting from a rural background. Uh, as all rural clinical schools are admitting 25% as a minimum, students from a rural background. And we were also training almost half our cohort of students in a rural clinical school. So what was particularly happening to those groups of students? As you can see um, from this slide, along with the, the same findings from many of the other rural clinical schools at the time, those factors were making a difference. Students from rural backgrounds were more likely to be in rural practice and those who'd been to a rural clinical school. What was particularly interesting in our results, I think, was the students who'd done that rural community clinical school primary care integrated year, followed by a second rural year at either Ballarat or Warrnambool, were the group most likely to be in rural practice. In fact, they were seven times more likely to be in practice. And you can see on the far right-hand side in the green, the group of rural background students who followed that pathway, nearly 70% of them were working rurally. Now, this sounds impressive. The problem was that only 42 students of our nearly 1,000 that had gone through the course had completed that pathway. We had a major capacity problem that students completing that longitudinal year, most of them had to go back to Geelong or even Melbourne for their fourth year. So we wanted to change that. And this gave us the evidence for what we needed to be, what we needed to be looking at doing. So along with this and many other conversations over a period of time with some of you in this room, we developed the vision for where we wanted to head. And that was really in partnership to really work with and commit to our region um, and the, the communities who were training our students. 
So we needed to actually not just be thinking about selecting rural background students, but students from our region, because they were the ones who were going to be much more likely to stay. Then provide them with two, rural, two years of rural training connected to their region. And, um, and the thing that we most value then was students staying in our region. So that was the, perhaps the easy bit. The harder bit was turning that into, operationalising it into something that was within our selection processes and training pathways within the course. So over the last couple of years, that's what we've been working on. And I'm pleased to say that with this year, we've got the first cohort starting in our rural training stream. The way we've set it up is that we have 30 of our domestic course places set aside for um, rural background students only but particularly for those from our, our area. So in terms of um, setting that up, we had to actually formally define what's become known as our rural footprint, um, the areas that train our students. And that was quite a, a bit, of, um, bit of work, but we've ended up using the local primary healthcare network as our outline, which aligned really closely with our training locations. And then using modified Monash model within that to come up with a list of locations that were considered our footprint. And then we were able to select, incorporate that in selection and um, give those students priority for those 30 places. So they're not competing with general, the 5,000 applicants we get each year for the general stream. We've, the other thing we added to the selection process was a written application because we also wanted to um, really qualitatively assess the students uh, applying for the stream in terms of their rural um, connection to their community, their, how they'd been involved and their sense of commitment to our rural our future as a rural health professional. Uh, and that was also a way of involving the rural communities in the selection of students for the stream, which has been terrific. And they're also involved in the um, interviews for us, our course. The next step we're wanting to take in terms of the admissions changes is to actually, we're looking at removing the GAMSAT from our admissions as well, because this is presenting a barrier, whereas we actually want to open the door for students from our region and, and look at recruitment rather than limiting um, selection. Students on the stream complete two years of clinical training in one of our rural clinical schools. And that's involved some capacity development to build that training pathway, particularly so that group from the Rural Community Clinical School can spend a second year in Ballarat or in Warrnambool. And that's a work in process, but we've really started doing that by building, developing fourth year rotations out at our RCCS sites, and that's been really successful so far. The next thing we're working on is the preclinical years, because two, two years is not enough. We don't want students to have to relocate to, from their rural communities. We would love them to be able to complete year one and two based in their um, communities. And that's been assisted by COVID and the fact that the year one and two has been delivered online for the last couple of years. So we're looking at the model for how we'll, we'll do that next. So having established the rural training stream in the MD, um, we realise in terms of getting to that from a rural high school, and that's, our, that's the group that we're wanting to see become rural health professionals, there's still um, quite a lot of distance between secondary school and a postgraduate MD. So then what we're now working on is bridging that gap and looking at how we connect with students in our region very early in secondary school with programs, um, with correct information about what we're looking for, um, about access to the course, and then um, assisting them to look at completing an undergraduate degree while they're remaining connected to their rural communities, and assisting them on that journey to then successfully enter the MD. So that's our part of the end-to-end -end training um, contribution. The, with the um, Ultimately, what we're wanting is to connect uh, this pathway and have learners throughout the journey uh, connecting together. So we're looking at having rural secondary students, but also rural undergraduates studying in the region and attracting current health professionals as well into this community of learners. It's going to be, this is a work in progress. It, it, we're going to develop this in partnership with communities that all need to be um, localised and contextual. But we want to um, 
basically streamline the journey and support it so that uh, students from the regions can enter the MD successfully. And the sorts of things we're thinking about are having work experience programs, pre-medical um, experiences, health professional um, exposure, uh, career coaching, how to, um, yeah, what are the options, what kind of undergraduate degrees that are useful, and providing support that's necessary um, for students, scholarships and academic support. So that's um, what we've been doing. I'm now going to just play a short video, which is one of our student, current students in Portland, who sort of describes um, the, the role of the pathway and the community of learners particularly that, that she's experiencing down there. Thank you. My name's Imogen, I'm a third year medical student and I'm doing my clinical placement in Portland, Victoria as part of Deakin's Rural Community Clinical School. I grew up about 45 minutes from here on a farm in Mumbana um, and I knew from the very start of my medical journey that I wanted to train and work rurally. This was probably the most important thing to me when I was applying to medical schools and what stood out about Deakin is that they really support and promote rural training. The best thing about studying in Portland this year is that I can really see the path that I'm on unfolding in front of me. We have a fourth year medical student that's living and working here. There's two ex deacon students doing their internship here and one of our GP registrars also did their training through Deakin and the Rural Community Clinical School. They've all been amazingly supportive this year and I think that's the real beauty of rural medicine. We're all in this together at the end of the day um, and it's such an advantage to have people who are on the same journey and not too far ahead of me to lead the way. Thanks. So that was Imogen. She's one of my students. I'm a GP as you heard from the introduction and when I arrived in Portland in late 1984, we had a chronic workforce shortage which really hadn't changed at all until perhaps the last year or so. And now I can see from, from Deacon's contribution and from our intern program that we actually do have some hope for the future in terms of our investment in our rural workforce. So let me just walk you through the, what's special about our training and how our learners have a longitudinal pathway in Portland. So as you've heard from Lara, our postgraduate uh, students who spend their third year immersed in our community and Imogen is one of those students. Following that year, they spend their general practice rotation, which is about five weeks, back in Portland, reconnecting with us and also connecting with the year three students and the interns and the community of learners that we've developed over this time. And then our vision expanded to creating an intern year so that those students could see themselves perhaps learning more and consolidating the learning that they've established in the previous two years by returning to a fam familiar and welcoming community. We then got a little bit excited about the fact that this intern year was going to be something that could really make a difference to Portland. And we actually also got accreditation for a PGY2 year. And at the moment, that um, position's being filled by a half-time ACRIM GP registrar. But we've also developed some advanced rural skills posts in Portland in the hope that our in, some of our interns might decide that they want to become rural generalist GPs. Because in a, in a relatively small community like ours, we see that rural generalist um, general practitioners are probably going to be the best way forward. That doesn't necessarily mean that our interns need to um, cement their pathway to becoming rural generalist GPs. One of my current interns has always, ever since he was a third year deacon student with us, wanted to do psychiatry. And what's more, he wants to be a psychiatrist who has a special interest in dual diagnosis, which is 
um, patients who have a, medic, um, a psychiatric illness but also a problem with substance use. But he doesn't want to work in the city and he doesn't want to train in the city. He wants to work and train rurally. So just imagine, those of you out there in your rural communities, can you imagine having a psychiatrist, if not living in your community, living close by, who's, we all desperately need skills like this in our communities. So this isn't just about training GPs, but it is about training doctors to live and work in rural communities and embrace those communities. So let's talk about the intern program because that's why I'm here really. Um, our interns have a different intern year to, the, to what I had, for instance. And, and the medical intern week starts with their, um, a Monday in the urgent care department with our FASM. And we did that because we only have a FASM on a Monday. So we had we had to put them in a place where they were going to be supervised appropriately. So that's, that was Monday. Then Tuesday, Wednesday and Thursday, the medical intern is, uh, spends his time doing rounds and working with the patients with a consultant physician. And then the best day, Friday, they spend with me in general practice. And they essentially consult independently, but they're, level, they're at level one supervision, so I have to supervise every single consult. For the surgical interns, a similar week spreads out before them. Monday, they spend in urgent care, working with their fellow intern and working with a FASM. Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday, they spend either in theater or doing surgical rounds. And on Friday, best day of all, they get to spend it with me. So what's unique about the learning that these guys get? So the benefits of the longitudinal model um, is that it provides the ability for the interns in Australia to consolidate and retain the knowledge by providing um, consistent um, teaching in multiple disciplines over a long period of time. Um, the alternative model of the short rotations, five to six weeks in certain disciplines means that it encourages this learning and dumping of information, whereas progressively learning a little bit and often for the 52 weeks allows you to keep that within your memory and apply that in clinical practice in a consistent basis over the 52 weeks. So that was Brad. And at the time that I said, you've got 30 seconds to talk about what's the best thing about the intern program. Um, he was the medical intern. He's just swapped over to become our surgical intern. And so what he was talking about was the fact that he doesn't just spend three months or 12 weeks working in medicine. He spends essentially six months doing that. And he felt that it was much more beneficial in terms of consolidating all of the learning that he needed to do over that time. The other special thing about our intern program is our learning environment. And both of them have said that they, they compare themselves to other interns that they know about. And they know that they've got a very special relationship with the people that they're learning with and from. So they almost have a one-to-one -one relationship with their specialist physician or surgeon and they obviously have a one-to-one -one relationship with me. They also work very closely with the nurses on the ward and our nurses in our practice and in GP. And about once a month, we schedule them some time with allied health practitioners. So they spend time with diabetes educator, they spend time with physio, they spend time in radiology, they spend time with the drug and alcohol counsellors so that they get to know how our drug and alcohol service works. And they really start to learn about what it's like to work in a team. So I wanted to talk a little bit about the benefit of this learning community that we've established. 
as we've mentioned, we have year three, two year three students and a year four student who comes back from year three. We have our two interns and we have a PGY2. And in my practice, we also host GP registrars and those registrars come from MCCC GP training. But on a Friday morning, we have a, a group learning session and we also invite our RVTS registrar who works at the Aboriginal Medical Service and she's a dynamo and you'll see a photo of her a bit later. And she's very excited to be able to come out of it. What's a, another relatively isolated learning environment in terms of the people that she's got in the practice with her to come and work and study with uh, the rest of our learning group. So our interns communicate with one another and they learn from each other. And there's only two of them. So rather than referring to, to MED or referring to Surge, they just have a chat with one another. And this year, our interns live together in a house that's owned by one of our um, fourth year deacon students. So he's been a bit entre entrepreneurial. I don't know about the rest of you, but in Portland, we have a critical rental shortage. And so he said, look guys, I've just bought this house because he wants to come back and be our intern and has been given an intern placement next year. I've got this house, why don't you guys rent it from me? So that's what they do. Now, two interns live with our fourth year deacon student, their landlord. So, Hi, my name's Kane. I'm one of the interns at Portland District Health. And I've been asked to mention what I think my favorite parts of the intern training program are down in Portland. And it's definitely the continuity of care that I get. So I get to see the patients in the emergency department and then follow them up on the wards. And then when they get discharged to the community, I get to follow them up through the GP clinic. This really helps me form good doctor-patient relationships as, a, as well as just appreciating the patient's journey through the healthcare system. And it really benefits my learning, getting to follow them up in three different avenues of medicine. Thank you. So I promise I didn't coach him at all, but I really do think that's a very valuable message that, you know, in the past, we don't necessarily train our doctors about um, the patient journey. We just we used to train in silos. But through this experience, the interns learn about how someone presents in an acute setting, how they're cared for in hospital and not you know, tertiary hospital medicine, they're, t they're taught about how grassroots medicine in a rural practice is, is practiced in a hospital and all in gen also in general practice. So one of the benefits of, this, of understanding the patient's longitudinal journey is that our interns also become very strong patient advocates. And um, one of my, one of the examples that really stands out for me is earlier this year, I had a patient of mine who was diagnosed with a rare form of bowel cancer and had to spend some time in our hospital. Now, the one person that she really clung to through that whole experience was Kane, who you just heard speaking, who actually provided her with some consistency of care. And he also was able to tell her that he was in constant communication with me, her GP, so that she knew that her GP had a good understanding of what was going on and was being kept in the clinical loop in terms of her ongoing management. And she found that very valuable. So our patients understand some of the barriers and difficulties that, that they're sorry, our interns understand those barriers and difficulties that their patients are exposed to in what can be a very difficult um, pathway to navigate. So this is, I'm gonna say my learning group, but it's our learning group really. Um, and so, and not all of them are present and I'll tell you why in a minute, but if you go from left to right, um, that's Rakesh, he's our GP registrar, who was a dermatologist in India before he came to Portland. His wife has a job in Portland, his son loves our secondary school, which I'm really grateful for, and they plan to stay 
in Portland. And then um, our, our two um, RCCS students, so um, got Brian with the orange coat on and Imogen in the front. I love Imogen's pink shoes. I was going to cut, crop that photo just to put their um, faces in, but I had to include those shoes. They're so great. Um, and then beside Imogen at the back, you've seen Brad talking already. And in the front is Beck, our um, RVTS registrar, who works at the Aboriginal Medical Service. And finally, Kane, who's, um, who was the surgical intern and is now our medical intern. Now, we also have another GP registrar who was a deacon student with us in third year and came back to work in Portland as an intern on rotation from another organisation before our intern program, oh sorry, PGY2, before our intern program really got established. Um, her name's Brittany and a week ago she gave birth to a little boy called Vincent, so she's not in the photo. And um, we've also got Greg, our famous fourth year student who's also the landlord, who had to attend some uh, learning at, um, in, in Warrnambool on that particular day and so couldn't be a part of the photograph. But you can see now that we're really starting to develop a learning community and a community of friends as well as people who learn together. And these guys all had this photo taken at a Friday morning education group, which they run and I just facilitate. So they decide what they want to learn. They also decide who's going to present. And occasionally I will present, but um, quite m more often than not, it's one of our learners. So finally, I just wanted to make mention of the importance of supervision. Our supervisors are one of our, our most valuable assets in a structure such as this, but they're also our most fragile. So every single minute I spend working clinically, I supervise somebody. I supervise somebody who's in that group that you just saw, usually more than one, often up to three or four people at a time. So supervisors are critical, but they're also the most fragile part of this structure. And we need to foster them and support them and try and maintain um, their sanity because they are one of the most critical parts of, how, of, of this particular framework that we've developed. Okay. Thank you. So I'm just going to summarise um, the end. Start at, at the best point that suits your organisation. You don't have to do the whole thing at once, but get a start. And once you get the start happening, the momentum will come. Um, we recognise the intern year was the hardest thing to crack, but we've done it. Um, we've proven to the PMCV and the AMC that a rural health service can host an intern for a whole year with no parent organisation at all. Um, we had to be pretty creative and manipulative to get to the people at PMCV to actually convince them we could do it, but we've done it so you can do it too. We've actually trailblazed it so get on and look at those interns because they are a pivotal part of keeping our students in rural areas. Be very flexible and have a plan B and a plan C, D, E in place because things change as, as you go along. And this is rural, it's in our DNA that we're gonna face challenges and changes. So be prepared. Get your thinking caps on, think left field. You can solve all those little problems as you go along. Be very resilient and creative. You will find the answers. Um, you'll often find them in places that you don't expect to, but they are out there. So the key points that I started with, there they are again revisited. Courageous, courageous leadership, get yourself armed with all the knowledge, understand the needs of each learning point, 
use your community and your wide net to actually bring it all together. Test every paradigm because that's all they are, they're paradigms and challenge them if you have to. Um, and find the right passionate people and it will sort of roll on um, on its own. Oh, sorry. So in summer, in finally finishing, this model is working for our community and it can be adapted to any rural community, but Marg talked about the supervision burden. And this model has been no funding. We have no funding from state or federal governments on this model. Um, it's been funded with goodwill um, and existing resources that were already there. But we actually need some dedicated funding to address the coordination and supervision requirements. A lot of the funding that's going into our medical education is getting lost in bureaucracies. We actually need one model that funds the medical training pathway for rural health. So that would be the message that I would leave you with. And the last slide is questions if there's any time. There's probably no time. That's okay.